it's, we're living in a basically a 21% oxygen environment, and that is extremely harsh. We're leaving every cell in our body open to what's called oxidative damage. These guys are nuts. They're living in 21% oxygen. When life arose, we didn't have an ozone layer. And so life had to deal with a much higher level of ultraviolet radiation than it has today. So I'm interested in those very specific questions, but also these very broad questions of evolution, which then transition into, could there be life elsewhere in the universe? My name is Lynn Rothschild. I'm from NASA Ames Research Center here at Moffett Field, California. And I also am a faculty member at Stanford University and at Brown University. And in my spare time, <laughs> uh, we had an opportunity to look through a microscope when I was in third grade, and that was it. The third day, we looked at protozoa, at amoebae, and I, I just fell in love. That was it. I went through school wanting to be a biologist. I had a, a brief flickering moment of thinking maybe I wanted to do environmental law or history of science, but I was really fortunate in that I had two wonderful professors in both those fields who said, I'd love to have you, Lynn, but you would miss being in the lab. What I really enjoy doing, besides looking through a microscope, is doing field work. Really going outside and getting my results outside, whether it's measuring solar radiation, which we've done quite a bit of over the last 10 years, or whether it's, it's mucking around in, in muddy streams at pH 10 up to my knees, and, or collecting microbes in Yellowstone or Africa or in the Andes. That to me is really fun. I've done a lot of work looking at organisms that can live in the environmental extremes. Okay, what organism can live at the highest temperature? What is the lowest temperature for life on Earth? What is the highest pH? What is the most acidic? And so on and so forth. Because by understanding the limits for life on Earth, we get some idea of what the minimum envelope is for life anywhere else out in the universe. Not the maximum, but at least the minimum. So if I go to Yellowstone and find an organism surviving in basically boiling battery acid, and we find some place on, well, Venus or wherever that has the same sort of conditions of boiling battery acid, we don't look at that and say, well, forget it. There's not gonna be anything alive. We can say, well, on Earth, there could be something alive there. So let's not scratch it off the list yet. And so I've done work in hot springs in New Zealand, which are very similar to the ones in Yellowstone. We've done some work in the outback in Australia where there's a radioactive spring near a uranium mine, which is fascinating for other reasons, of course. Um, we've done some work in the Rift Valley in Kenya where the pH is very, very high. And most recently, um, in collaboration with Scott Parazinski, an astronaut who's been up on several of the shuttle flights, we've had experiments go up Mount Everest. So I sat there in the comfort of my own lab, but I talked Scott and Keith Cowan, who went with him, into taking some of our experiments and taking solar spectra and so on. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. So I, I did the field trip to Everest by proxy. <laughs> There's a certain amount of adventure and it's, it's a certain amount of releasing my inner child. I mean, I'm getting paid really to be a grown up five-year-old. <laughs>